Yeah, we're about to go live now. Yeah. Cool. Good evening uh, and welcome to the um, to the uh, Changing Face of Pharmacy event on today, um, Monday, 20th of April. So um, apologies about the delay. Uh, we've just had a few technical issues. We were supposed to have one of our guests, uh, Tony Cole from Barclays. He's having a bit of a technical issue getting online at the moment. So hopefully as soon as he's here, um, we will go out there. So for um, today's event, it's really all about aesthetics and how that's affecting um, the, how that's changing the uh, market for everyone. Um, a non-surgical um, aesthetics market is worth around three billion pounds currently. Um, and that trend is likely to rise over the next few years, um, at least up to 2025. 20, um, so, for someone who owns a pharmacy or um, for someone who uh, or even those that don't own a pharmacy one of the good things about aesthetics is that you can set up your own clinic without too much of an expense um, with the pharmacy cuts it has made things a lot difficult for everyone and while everyone's looking for new ways um, or new revenue streams this is one area um, that has uh, a lot of people are interested um, and with it being a really fast growing market and something that's quite easy, easily uh, learned uh, as a skill is something a lot of pharmacists and ph and pharmacies are looking into. Um, now for tonight's event, we have uh, two experts. Uh, we have um, Fahim Ahmed, uh, who is the CEO of MedLearn. Um, he's a pharmacist award, um, who won an award last year for one of the best pharmacy of, pharmacists of the year. Um, he is someone who's spent a lot of time, um, energy and uh, a lot of money in learning about aesthetics and teaching others as well. He's got a proven track record of putting what he says into practice and showing that uh, as a pharmacy owner, um, you can increase your revenue streams through other services, um, especially through aesthetics. We also have um, Dr. Camille uh, Assad, uh, who is a, um, a plastic surgeon for the NHS, uh, working in Oxford and Wessex University uh, Hospital. Uh, now, Dr. Camille um, is actually running a uh, a fundraiser for trying they basically they want to uh, because of shortage of the PPE that they're looking at repurposing scuba diving masks so he'll go into a bit more detail about what he's doing with those and how how much money they need to raise uh in order to repurpose the uh, masks into uh reusable PPE well his his expertise is in, as is as a plastic surgeon and on the event tonight he will talk a lot more in a lot more detail about uh the uh, to how to do the aesthetics procedures um our initial plan was to try and show you how a, a procedure works uh as on a live model uh but due to covid and restrictions around movement we've decided we'll do that as a separate event later on um, so hopefully later on tonight, uh, you will have uh, Dr. Camille um, talking in more detail about that. And over the next few months, once lockdown is over, we will go and do a um, live uh, session around the country to show you guys how um, how a procedure works. And you'll be able to ask a bit, a few more questions on uh, on the day um, about how to uh, learn how to do the procedures. Um, now, Tony, uh, Tony Cole, he's the Barclays Business Relationship Manager in Manchester with a specialism in um, healthcare. He was supposed to be here today, but again, due to technical difficulties, he's not been able to make it. So um, we will leave you his contact details so that you can get hold of him if you should you need any um, uh, advice on the financing side. Uh, Barclays are very keen on um on the healthcare side to support pharmacists in this uh, current period. And generally they have been quite supportive of the healthcare sector. Um, so Tony is always available to help anyone um, and answer any questions that you may have. So on to our first guest, uh, Fahim Ahmed. Uh, he will now talk to you about the aesthetic side as a pharmacy owner um, and 
uh, what how much it'll cost to set things up and also the pharmacist without a pharmacy and how um, you can upskill and leverage your skill to improve your income and um, have something to negotiate with uh, with a with your employers so on to Fahim Nope, sorry for him. Can you can you hear me now, Tahdul? Can you hear me, Fahim? I can hear you and great. Uh, well, uh, before we get into this, I just want to just get go through some uh, so we don't have any technical issues. Right. Can you see my screen? Can you see I the can see you, yes. I mean the presentation can be seen. Uh I can bring that on. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Right. So good evening, folks. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Fahim. I'm the pharmacy prescriber, contractor, founder of Medlin. And uh, before we get into this, I just want to thank Tohidul for organizing this. I think it's absolutely mind blowing his, you know, the way the cooperative have been supporting pharmacists and have been, you know, really leading from the front for pharmacists. And I just want this to be on the record that I have, with the will of God, Alhamdulillah, signed up to the cooperative for 20 pound a year you know what they're offering is absolutely mind-blowing so folks if you have not joined or not part of the cooperative you really need to think about it look into it because you want to work with like-minded people people who share the same vision and i want to start to just basically delve into a bit about a vision which is extremely important when we're talking about anything you do even if it's aesthetics or setting up your private practice very important Quick shout out to Barclays Bank for organizing this and uh, a great thank you to the NHS, to pharmacists, nurses, doctors for everything that they're doing, social care, healthcare. So, you know, uh, absolutely mind blowing for wh whatever we're all doing for the public. And, uh, you know, I hope we all stay safe. So Medlin. So Medlin is a organization that was uh, that just revolved around one basic vision. We have one vision. And that is, it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you believe in, doesn't matter what your race is, doesn't matter what, you know, what your thinking is. But I believe that in this day and age, we should all have access to great healthcare. Okay, let me repeat that again. In the 21st century, we should not be worrying about lack of PPE. We should not be worrying about shortage of doctors. We shouldn't be worrying about shortage of nurses. We should not be worrying about a lack of healthcare. Okay, we're quite fortunate here in this country, but imagine places like Africa, places like Pakistan, India, where they don't have the government support. How we're going to change this is by having healthcare professionals like yourself who are inspired, who are motivated, who want to make a difference, who are educated, who have the skills, who have the experience and have the finances to make a difference to people's lives, folks. And it's really important to understand that if we all today in this room or wherever you're sat, we were all millionaires, do you really think that we'd be having a diff that we couldn't make a difference to the NHS and help those needy? I want you to think about that. A vision is important. One of the reasons why I work quite closely with Tohedul and the Cooperative because they share a vision of making a difference. And if you want to get into aesthetics, you need to have a plan, folks. Let me make it clear to you and, and say it once more: you need to have a vision. You need to have a plan. What's going to drive you every morning when you're struggling with your aesthetics practice? What's going to drive you every morning when you get up and someone says to you, you can't do this, you're a pharmacist. What's going to drive you when down the street you've got a nurse who's doing aesthetics, you've got a dentist doing aesthetics, you've got a cardiologist, you've got a dermatologist, you've got all the different healthcare professionals doing aesthetics. What makes you different? It's your vision and it's your drive. So now that I've mentioned that, we can start to move forward into the presentation itself. And... Uh, I just want you to have a look at, I think it's starting, have a look at this graph or this graphic that I have here for you. And I want you to take a picture of this. I want you to make a mental note of this, that setting up any private practice requires a map, requires a thinking process, requires an outline. If you want to today walk to London or you want to drive to Cornwall or you want to go cycle somewhere, if you don't have a vision or you don't have a roadmap, you don't have a plan, how are you going to get there? Think about it. If you just want to do aesthetics, but you don't know what you want to do with it. And interestingly enough, I was speaking to another pharmacist recently and this lady had asked me, Fahim, how do I get into aesthetics? I said, that's easy. Get the training and I can show you how that's done. But what happens after that? 
And I know so many pharmacists who have aesthetic skills and training, they can't get a job because they've not thought about it deep enough. So I intend to demonstrate to you through my journey, the difficulties that I had, how you can also set this up, how you can also do exactly what I did, but quicker, more efficiently, and without making the mistakes that I made. That's the plan. Now, we did have a different idea. I wanted to, to demonstrate to you how to administer Botox, how to administer you know, uh, uh, fillers, the importance of injection anatomy, the importance of knowing where you're placing the product. But it's it's going to be really difficult, folks, for me to demonstrate that over a webinar. So instead, we've had to slightly take a bit of a U-turn and to demonstrate it in this way. So, you know, hang on and let's go to this together. Right. So firstly is I want to show you and explain to you why I got into aesthetics, how I actually by mistake landed into aesthetics. I want to demonstrate to you my journey as a pharmacist to a business owner. I want to discuss with you the benefits and the difficulties that I had to upskilling and being very careful what company you decide to upskill with and what your thought process is, level seven and so forth. There's a lot of, a lot of jargon out there and, and words I get used. We'll be, we'll be discussing that. And how to put theory into practice. Now, here is a base book. It's on anatomy. And there are pages and pages and pages about facial anatomy, about knowing how the muscles work, about knowing what would happen if things go wrong. But the reality is, how do you put that into practice, folks? Anybody can pick up a book. But the point is, how do you put it into practice? How do you make sure what you're doing is safe? How do you make sure that your product is placed at the right depth? How do you know that you're using the right product? How do you know that your patient is safe? A lot to think about, folks, when you enter aesthetics. And then when you have that, how do you benefit financially? How do you make money out of it? If you're not going to make money out of it, then what's the, you know, why? Again, you need to ask yourself, why is it you do what you do? What's going to drive you every morning to do this? So a bit of background. I qualified in 2010 as a pharmacist. And with the will of God and the help of my siblings, I went, up to, I went on to set up a pharmacy business. And anybody who's been in 100 hours knows it's not easy. It's a lot of hours. And, you know, things went a bit difficult for me because I couldn't really balance my working life with my family life. It ended up with me having a divorce. In addition to that, it became very difficult because we had funding cuts. And you can imagine now, one side you've got a divorce, and the other side now someone has literally pulled the rug beneath, you know, beneath your feet. And there you are working nine, you know, eight in the morning to 11 at night, seven days a week. And before you know it, bang. All gone. So I started thinking, I said, you know what? I can't function like this. What's the biggest mistake that I made in this period? And that was I didn't educate myself. I wasn't obsessed with learning. I was obsessed with making money. I was obsessed with, you know, working in my business, but I stopped educating myself. I stopped working with those people who have the same vision, same ideas. I stopped working on improving the biggest chip that you have in this, you know, this cavity that you have in this brain. And that's, that's this... You know, this, your cerebral cortex, you can be as funky as you want, but we're talking about up-chipping up or upskilling this brain. When was the last time that you learned something new? Ask yourself this. When was the last time that you educated yourself? Because wealth is knowledge, folks. It's not running after that pound dollar sign or running after money. It's educating yourself. And so then I started to learn. I started to find out what was going on. I came across this document that was written in 2013. If you've not read it, I'd recommend you read it. Now or never shaping pharmacy for the future. And it basically spoke about everything that's happened today. Pharmacists are going to have funding cuts. If you don't develop into... If you don't look into different avenues, your pharmacy business is going to struggle. If you don't upskill yourself, you're going to struggle. Technology will marginalize the role. Think of different professions, physician associate, nursing associate, paramedics. Everyone is upskilling. Where does the pharmacist stand? So I started researching. I started to look at what was going on in my business. And what I re realized was I didn't have a plan. We set up a business. We set up a 100-hour pharmacy. Then what? What was the plan? You've got a pharmacy business, what do you do next? I didn't really understand who was my customer. I needed to find out what was missing. And through research and learning, what I found out that you're one of your biggest customers, the NHS folks. If you don't know what the NHS is asking for, what the NHS wants, it's very difficult to satisfy your customer. So then, you know, I did some research and I found out that, you know, 95% of people in the UK can get access to a pharmacy 
by foot in 20 minutes. 1.6 million people visit a pharmacy every day. We are accessible. And we've demonstrated it now, where others have closed their door, pharmacy is open. So we're accessible. And then I thought, wait a second, what do people want? So I did a survey and initially I said, you know what, I'm gonna focus on my non-medical prescribing. I'm gonna focus on, I'm gonna focus on developing my prescribing skills. Aesthetic has been around for a long time. It's not something new. It's a huge industry, but I knew that for me, aesthetics initially, and I'll tell you how I fell into it, wasn't, wasn't for me because I thought, how am I going to compete with everybody else who's got aesthetics practice? How am I going to compete with Tohidul who might be an aesthetics practitioner? How am I going to compete with a nurse? How am I going to compete with a, with a dermatologist? But what I did know is if I can develop my prescribing qualification, I could definitely make a difference because there's a shortage of doctors, there's a shortage of nurses. That's the gap in the market. So I then went on a journey and you know went into Anglia Ruskin and I did my non-medical prescribing. I never realized that the university course is not there to teach you clinical skills. If you go back and you look into the history of non-medical prescribing, you have to be competent in what you do. And then you go on to get your prescribing qualification. But I did it the other way around. I thought once I had my qualification, I could prescribe. And... I remember seeing my first patient represented at the pharmacy and we had this business plan set up what we were going to do well financially and we're going to tap into this market and she had trouble swallowing everything fell apart because at that time i never realized that making a clinical you know the clinical decision making process not that straightforward just because you see doctors writing prescriptions of phenoxymethyl penicillin or just because you see a dentist writing a you know a prescription for for metronidazole does not mean that that it's always a dental infection, it's an abscess, it's always tonsillitis, folks. There's a lot more to it. And then I realized that what if this was a Quincy? What if it was tonsillitis? What if she wasn't vaccinated? Could it have been even possibly diphtheria? Could it have an infection in the retropharyngeal space and so forth? So I had to change my plan because I realized that at this very moment in time, setting up my private practice for prescribing wasn't the way. So I went into aesthetics. So I went into aesthetics, I searched many courses. There was a lot of talk about level seven. There was a lot of talk about aesthetics and how we can help you. This company said we can help you. This company said we can help you. And there's so many companies out there. And I went by reviews and so forth. And I joined a particular company who, who were good. I enrolled on the level seven course, uh, but I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't satisfied with the course because the pharmacist has different learning needs compared to a nurse and compared to a doctor. You can't pull them in the same category. You can't, as we say, paint them under the same brush. So I then thought, you know what? I'm not enjoying this. There's so much theory. I don't have an understanding of anatomy. I don't have an understanding of physiology. How do I do this? So I got in touch with the clinicians at Medlin. I started speaking to Dr. Ake, Dr. Faison, and the different doctors. I said, look, I want to do aesthetic. What's important? And the first thing they said was, you need to know your anatomy. And let me repeat that again. You need to know your anatomy because if you're going to be using, not that this is a syringe, but if you're going to be injecting a product inside the human body, you need to know where that's going. More importantly, focus injection anatomy. Where am I placing the product? What layers is the product going under? Now we know that the epidermis, that the dermis, and there's the, you know, you have the smooth, you have, sorry, not smooth, but you have muscle. Then you have the, you know, you have fascia, and then you have the vessels and so forth. But there's levels to this. If you inject a filler in the wrong depth, under the wrong tissue, you're not going to get A, the right results. And secondly, you might be more prone to injury and not giving the patient the best aesthetic results. So I had to go back and learn my anatomy. I don't recommend this for everyone, but I started to go back and start to do human dissection so I could really link the aesthetics to theoretical training with practical training. And I also understood that just because I can develop my aesthetics training or develop the knowledge does not mean that I can run a business. Just because you have a skill, the question is how do you market it? How do you know about what Medellin does? How do you know about Mohammed somewhere does aesthetics training? How do you market your business? So Mrs. Phillips or, you know, could be a male patient as well who wants to visit you. How do they know what, what service that you're offering? So when you think about aesthetics, not only is it important to worry about your training, not only is it important to worry about that you get the right training and hands-on experience of anatomy, 
but it's also important to make sure that someone can teach you how do you run, set up a sustainable business that gives you revenue, that gives you an income stream. There's one thing you having the knowledge, folks, and there's one thing you marketing that service. Two different things. So write it down. If you want to do aesthetics, first of all, what training company should I go to? Do they have the same vision that I have? Do they have the same? Do they are they on my level? Secondly, can they teach me how to turn this knowledge and to help others a benefit financially, so I can grow my business and to then employ pay people and so they can help their families and so forth? What's the plan? Okay. Regarding level seven, I just want to touch on this. Level seven is is basically what that basically is is a is a higher form of education. Okay. Once you become a master's level student, you work at level seven. It's a vocation. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a vocational way of serving masters. And most prescribing courses now, or sorry, most aesthetic courses are at level seven. But more importantly than level seven is, do I get the experience I'm looking for? Do they give me access to cadavers that I can see the anatomy? Do I get mentoring? Do I get trained by an individual who, can, who knows how we deal with pharmacists and how a pharmacist thinks? Because our learning needs are totally different. The other day I was actually mentoring Lisa, one of a, a nurse practitioner who's also recently gone to aesthetics, and we had the same conversation. And I was again explaining to Lisa that it's very important that you understand your anatomy. It's very important you understand depth, where you're placing your product. And then in additionally to that, you need to have access to a team of mentors and a network to support you because it's all easy when you're getting taught by myself and you're getting taught by a different institution. When you're out there all alone, do you have someone who you could pick up the phone to and say, what do I do? I think I've caused an occlusion. I think the product's placed at the wrong depth. I think they're having, you can see the Tyndall effect as we call it because the product has been placed too superficial. For him, what do I do? You need to have access to a network. You need to have a support network and you need to go out and educate yourself. Regarding how much it costs, courses can vary. So if you are deciding to get into it, get in touch with myself. I'm happy to discuss it with you. Courses vary in terms of what they teach you. The price varies as well. Level seven can start from anywhere between 7,000 to 10,000 pounds. Okay. So courses do vary in terms of the cost. So you do have to invest in yourself. And pharmacists, you need to understand this, that you need to invest in yourself and educate yourself if you want to benefit financially. If you're not prepared to make the biggest investment in your life, but you're prepared to have the latest iPhone, you're prepared to have the latest watch, you're prepared to have the latest car, but you're not prepared to invest in yourself, how are you going to learn? How are you going to move forward? So that's really, really important to keep these things in, keep these things into check. And let me show you the kind of content that you need to think about producing if you want to get into aesthetics. Have a look at, let me demonstrate this for you. So these were the problems that I had no support, no experience, unable to reflect on my practice. Again, folks, really important to reflect on your practice. And what we mean by reflecting on our practice is that it's really important for you to be able to know when things go wrong and know who to speak to and develop and improve on that. So I'm just going to just go through this with you so you can have a look at this and see the kind of content you need to develop. Just have a look at this. Should be starting any moment now. Right, so that was there just to show you the importance of having access to, to a great team. And there's Dr. Ake, one of the A&E consultants who helps you with my prescribing practice. 
you know, hats off to the doctors. Dr. Camille is another one that's going to be coming on shortly. It's, uh, you know, I've, I'm surrounded by good people. I'm surrounded by people who believe in my vision, who continually help me so I can grow my practice. So any one of you who's interested in, in aesthetics and you want some advice, folks get in touch. Uh, myself and Dr. Camille have set up a special aesthetics program dedicated to pharmacists where we teach you from start to finish, from anatomy all the way to function anatomy to show you how to inject, what product you should use. And we're going to be starting some webinars as well. So that's going to be exclusively uh, part of the, the co-op. So for those of you who are part of the co-op, get in touch, sign up so you can get access to this great learning that we're going to be doing. There's my contact number there. If you've got any questions, get in touch. And uh, folks, that is all for me today. And thank you very much and stay safe. Thanks, Fahim. Um, thanks for coming online. And just have a couple of questions before you go off. Okay. Um, just for a lot of pharmacists uh, who are, in, who are um, quite, either new, newly qualified, um, how would some, do they have to wait for a number of years, like with independent prescribing course, or can they just, uh, once, as soon as they qualify, can they just go on and become, uh, do the aesthetics course and start uh, practicing? Right, so hello, thank you for the question. And uh, I actually missed that. But it, that's really important to understand. Okay, so you as a pharmacist, and let me make it clear to you, you as a pharmacist, once you've been trained, you declare, once you've had the training and you're competent, and I've written a piece about what shows that you're competent, what shows that you're not competent. Okay, that's a separate discussion to have. But once you're competent as a pharmacist, you could be newly qualified, it could be your first day, if you've had the right training and you feel that you are competent and you've been on a course that demonstrates that you could start to inject Botox and fillers from day one. However, the caveat to this is that if you're not a prescriber, you are, you would need someone to prescribe that for you so you could administer the medication. Let me make that clear. If Thoidul, for example, was a newly qualified pharmacist and he can't prescribe, obviously, because you have to be, you know, two years qualified before you can prescribe. And he was to get in touch with me. I would act as his prescriber. I would have to do a face-to-face -face consultation. You have to do a face-to-face -face consultation. You cannot prescribe for Botox and fillers remotely. You can't have Fahim sat in Oxford prescribing for you, folks. That is not right. That is actually illegal. And you need to go look at the guidance by the GMP who made it very clear that it has to be a face-to-face -face consultation. So I would write the prescription. I would then give that prescription and cash it into one of uh, to Tohidul or to one of the uh, online bodies that will then deliver the medication to Tohidul. Then Tohidul can administer. However, if you're a prescriber and you want to do this, you would need to be comfortable that Tohidul is competent because you also will be in, in, you have now seen that patient, you will also have liability for this. So if Tohidul administers inappropriately or something goes wrong, you've done the prescription. So if you're a prescriber and you want to do this, it's a good, it can be done. I prescribe for a lot of local beauticians. I prescribe for a lot of nurses. I prescribe for a lot of pharmacists. It can be done, but you need to make sure you're safe. Tohidul, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. And thanks for the detailed uh, answer. So, and I'll just want to do one more question. Um, yeah. If I was an independent, if I was an, uh, um, if I had my own pharmacy. Yeah. A, how much space do I need to set up a, an aesthetics clinic? Um, and B, how much would it cost me as an owner to set up something like this? Okay. First of all, folks, you need to understand aesthetics is a different ballgame in the sense that if you've got a consultation room and you want to start doing aesthetics in a consultation room, that might not work too well because people are paying you 200, 300 pounds for the experience. If you've got a tiny consultation room and just a room, and you think I'm just going to do an aesthetics process, it might not work for you because aesthetics is all about, it's all about, I don't want to use the word vanity. I want to say it's, it's all about the way you look. It's all about the experience. So you need to ask yourself as a pharmacist owner, what experience am I giving to my patient? What experience am I giving to my client? So how much does it cost? How long is a piece of string? But I would say that if you wanted to have a, if you wanted to set up a consultation room, one, Rule number one, it's really important to make sure that you consider that your practice is safe and you've got a, uh, you're, you're following at least, at least you're following basic, uh, what we say, you know, uh, 
So the what's the word I'm looking for? You're following basic, you know, uh, cleanliness. Huh. Cleanliness. There's a cl governance. Uh, uh, antimicrobial, not antimicrobial, but you're looking at uh, making sure that basically you're bacteria free. So you want to make sure that your that your floor is raised to the floor, raised to the ground, a couple of centimeters up. That's going to be important because eventually, if you set up an aesthetics clinic and you're going to go down the road of CQC, you need to make sure that you're meeting their standards. And CQC have clear standards that you can see online. You can visit CQC, but as a pharmacist, even as a pharmacist, what's your infection control policy? Think about it. You're dealing with, you're now doing in a minute, might be minimally invasive, folks, but it's still invasive. You are using a needle and you're penetrating the skin. So infection control is going to be important. Okay. I'm not saying that everybody start investing and changing the flooring, but make sure that you have clean and it's a tidy practice. Secondly, you imagine that Tohidul comes to my practice and he's spending 400 pounds on a procedure. And I am earning, I mean, my aesthetic practice for three days a week, I generate around nine and a half to anywhere between 10,000 pounds a month on my practice. Okay. Now, Tohidul comes to my chemist, he invests 500 pounds for a procedure. And he walks into a room that's got clutter. It doesn't look clean. How's he going to feel? What 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 experience are you giving him? Is he going to come back to you? I wouldn't go I back. Think, I think that's that's the key thing that if you're going to do it in a pharmacy, um, in your own pharmacy, it has to look right. Um, aesthetics, as much as we would like to um, say, you know, is you know take it on as a as a as separate income revenue stream. It needs to be looked at as a whole separate business as well in that it's Absolutely. all about beauty uh, and Definitely. it's all about what you're selling as well, the confidence and having a nice, clean environment. If you can't provide that, you're not going to inspire confidence in your clients and they're not likely to be coming back or spending their money uh, in the first place uh, with you. I so I think that, that's, that's a key factor there. Uh, and and I, I just want to say that... Uh, Experience, folks, is really important. If you're going to be doing aesthetic, experience is extremely important. So that's 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 really important that you give the right experience. Secondly, what's really really important with aesthetics is the there's a difference in a clinic and a consultation room. There's a difference in a clinic and a consultation room. Just have a look at your dentist. Have a look at your you know your your practice down the street. Remember that. There's a difference in a clinic and a consultation. If you understand this concept and you understand, like, let me tell you, why do you buy a Ferrari? It's great. It looks fantastic. The experience it gives you. So why should I go visit Tohidul's chemist who's doing aesthetics versus Fahim's? If you're knowledgeable, you've got video. And folks, let me tell you something. You can compete with a doctor. You can compete with a nurse. You can compete with a pharmacist. That can all be done. Don't ever feel undermined by anyone. I've had some people on LinkedIn say to me that they felt undermined. There's nothing to feel undermined about. Nothing to feel in mind about. Educate yourself, have the skills, and you can demonstrate that people will come and see you. And it's a huge, huge revenue option. It can be done, but it must be done the right way. Don't make the mistakes that I made. Okay, thank you, Fahim. Uh, and thanks for all your uh, you. knowledge. Um, and we will now go on to Dr. Kimiel Asad. Um, he'll go into the more technical details of um, aesthetics. Uh, welcome to the... Welcome to the show, Camille, Dr. Camille. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly now. So um, just again, just as a quick reminder, Dr. Camille um, is um, a plastic surgeon working for the NHS Oxford and uh, West Sussex um, NHS Hospital. Um, and he's doing a really wonderful job um, with these uh, PPE um that is repurposing uh, from scuba diving, uh, scuba diving mass into uh, reusable PPE. So I want him to give you a bit more information about that first before we go on to our actual program. So um, yeah, please. Great. Oh, thank you very much. So basically, what we've got here is um, this is a snorkel mask. It fits very quickly on now. So normally the tube would be at the top here. And uh, this has been done in various places around the world, Italy, Eastern Europe, America. Quite a lot of people are doing this independently and open sourcing the data. So you take the scuba mask, you 3D print a connector. Uh, sorry, okay, there we go. And then we add a HME filter. So this normally belongs to an anesthetic machine, and this is a disposable filter. 
And this particular one can uh, filter the COVID-19 virus. Not all of them can, so it's important to, to get every, every one correct. And this connects on here. And um, essentially, you just put it on like a mask, like so. And we've been doing fit testing and so on, and it has passed that. So we're still doing some further quantitative testing. So not everybody who has published this or is using it is actually putting it through the same level of testing that we are at the moment. Uh, so we're, this is, the advantage of this is this is reusable. Uh, you clean it, the healthcare worker, doctor, nurse, physio, whatever, will keep there to look after it. This can last 28 days, uh, assuming seven hours a day usage. So this is going to be a replaceable part, but this is cheap. This whole thing at the moment is about 35 quid. Um, the main cost Sorry, you're breaking up. Uh, how much, how much does it cost? Uh, I think we're losing. The main you. Sorry. cost is the mark. Oh, sorry. Um, th can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. I'll come a bit closer. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Thirty-five pounds. Okay. Uh, Thirty-five pounds for the whole unit at the moment. The biggest mm -hmm. cost is the is the mask itself, um, just because we're buying um, buying them kind of commercially. So we're okay. we're crowdfunding to get the money for this. Um, hopefully, in time, we can get a, a cheaper solution. But obviously, uh, you know, speed is of the essence. Um, so we've got a crowdfunding page, uh, Oxford Bash Inspired dot com. We'll take you to that link, or if you find me on social media. Uh, I'm on We've Twitter, actually added the link to the YouTube live description, so if you're oh, looking to uh, find out who it is on the descriptions. So um, I'd be very grateful if people could share or donate or, or ideally both, um, just to get just to get the the word out. Because um, you know, if we've got some more re reusable PPE, that that will help with some of the shortages because you know people are having to use several masks a day obviously because you have to change it between shifts uh, between patient or uh, between procedures or breaks etc uh, depends on specifically what you're using and this has the advantage of being basically to the, at least if not more protection as an ffp3 mask and uh, the facial protection all all in one um so yeah so just a, a bit of that i'm very grateful uh, to Adol for you giving me the opportunity to, to talk about this. No, no, that's fine. You're doing an amazing job there. Um, and obviously with the current shortage and the situation that we're in, it's, it's really great work. It's something that we really need to do. So um, how much are you looking to raise for this uh, for this um, uh, mask? About 150,000, because that will get us 3,000 masks with, there's a few other costs for testing and so on. Um, oh. There's about seven doctors working on this, um, oh. mostly plastic surgeons, as it randomly happens. <laughs> But some anaesthetists and research fellows as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, plastic surgery has got a long history of innovation in times of crisis. We began as a specialty in World War One, um, or shortly after World War One, and so we're heavily carrying that on. But as I said, we don't pretend that we invented this. Um, we've done our own refinements of it, uh, but we're testing it rigorously to the same standards, pretty much, as a, to get a CE mark. Um, and we're scaling it. Um, so I think that's that's the difference there. That's and we're getting distributed for free. And none of us are taking, obviously, it goes without saying, but just to stress that none of us are taking any personal money, um, you know, for this. All funds raised go into the masks, uh, you know, just to be transparent. That's right. Thank you. Th thanks for that. Um, so just on to our um, talk tonight about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit more about the technical side of it? I know we've just heard from Fahim about the business side and as a pharmacist, yeah. uh, what you need to do. Uh, but as a plastic surgeon with years of experience um, and you do this, it's something that you're doing day in, day out. Yeah. Tell us how, how the whole technical side of it works, because I know a lot of pharmacists are really they, it's it's quite a scary thing. It's not something that we do. We deal with drugs. We can tell you all yeah. about the side effects and stuff. But when it comes to injections and stuff, it's not really our uh, forte. Uh, so yeah, uh, please do tell us a lot more about. Uh, well, about there's, the there's so many different aspects um, to it because there's many different treatments. Um, so for example, obviously everyone's heard of Botox. Everyone's heard of fillers. Those are the, the most common things. Um, and uh, 
it, it's an attenuated botulinum toxin type A, um, and that is given as an intramuscular injection, so it's either into or just on top of the, the muscle, uh, and it inhibits the uh, acetylcholine at the motor end plates and gives a temporary paralysis, which should last anywhere between three and six months. Um, generally speaking, uh, you would give a fairly standard dose initially if it's the first time you're seeing a patient, um, or you'd certainly give a dose on the conservative side, and then I would reassess them in two weeks' time and top up as needed, and then you can then bear that in mind for dosing in, in the future. Um, there are many, many, many applications of Botox. It's actually incredible what it actually can treat. So obviously everybody's heard of um, treating wrinkles. So the commonest, obviously, the uh, forehead wrinkles, uh, particularly here as well, the glabella region, this area between the eyebrows and top of the nose. The crow's feet here, uh, again, is a, a very uh, common area to treat. Um, I don't personally use it below the eyelids i don't personally use it around the mouth but some people do um and there are pros and cons of of that um but that would be you know the sort of glabella forehead and crow's feet that is the majority of what people ask for that's the majority of what people like that's your kind of you know your 80 20 split that's your 80 percent right there pretty much um so get good at the basics really um i know for him talked about how to get good at the basics in terms of really mm -hmm. It starts with the anatomy. I mean, you don't need to dissect a lot of, you know, bodies or go back to medical school. You do need to know a little bit, but equally, you know, we can focus the, the training of that, um, to sort of tell you what you need to break it down. Um, I mean, I'm a big believer in simplifying medicine. I think there's a lot of mystification of medicine out there. And I think that's quite territorial. And I, I don't think that, that that's that, to anybody's advantage, um, and certainly not anymore. Um, we want to break up fillers, everybody has heard of. Um, most commonly used one is hyaluronic acid, which naturally occurs in the ground substance. This again has the advantage and slash disadvantage of it being a temporary filler. It's generally absorbed by the body. Um, yeah, there are isolated case reports of it persisting. The advantage of it being absorbed by the body is, number one, if you get it wrong, um, it should disappear with time. Obviously, there are other things you can do to mitigate it, such as massaging it around, or there is a um, something called hyalase, which is an enzyme that dissolves hyaluronic acid. You can use that if you're if you're really struggling. Um, and again, this is a classic thing to augment the lips or to reduce the um, nasolabial lines here um, or the nasodugal lines here below the eyes. Again, something you do not enter lightly. Again, it's all about proper training. Um, and again, how far you want to take it? Well, there's, generally speaking, you can take the approach of taking a cosmetic refresh, or you can go full out. And some people actually want to look like they've had a cosmetic procedure or cosmetic surgery. And some people see it as a, as a status sign if they've got massive lips. If, you know, they want their breasts or their lips to look unnatural. Um, what I would say about hyaluronic acid is, again, it's got a lot of other potential applications. Generally speaking, it's a, the lower molecular weight hyaluronic acid is used for the lips and nasal labor folds and so on. There are a larger molecular weight things, macrolane, for example. I'm not sure if that's in use anymore. Um, it's not something I, I use. But when people talked about the boob jab, they actually inject it into the breast to augment it, which is a terrible thing, uh, in my opinion. They use it for penile augmentations. I, it just, it's just, I wouldn't touch that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, there's enough work to be done by just getting the fundamentals right. Um, if you get that right, I mean, obviously, again, as Fahim said, you want to get your clinic nice. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to look like, um, you know, you don't need to go overboard with that, but, you know, get the experience, get the marketing and so on. But actually, you know, if you haven't got the fundamentals right, then it doesn't matter how, how nice your, your consulting room is, your, your procedure room is. Um, yeah. And for I think for for pharmacists, um, I think a lot of the quite people would be wondering, um, what are the most common procedures that um, that they would face in uh, uh, that 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 they'd face? Is it just uh, the augmenting the lips, um, the uh, wrinkles on the forehead and around the eyes? I mean, is that as complicated as it gets, or is there oh, yeah. um, more complicated procedures? 
Well, you can definitely get more complicated, but I think those will be the, the commonest. That will be what most people will be looking for. Uh, but again, one has to, sometimes people are asking for something, but that's not quite what they want, which is where the sort of, you know, learning about the assessment and what the other options are, because sometimes, sometimes if it's too long, you know, if they're sort of 70 years old and everything's dropped down, then they probably need a facelift at the end of the day. Um, but there are other things like skin resurfacing. So like you get photo aging of the skin and that can, you can use a, a laser for that. You can use a, a peel for that. Dermabrasion is less commonly done, which is basically um, a machine that literally sandblasts the face, if you like, in inverted commas, medical control. <laughs> Not very much anymore, but you can still get home microdermabrasion kits, so people will still still do that. Um, things like uh, you may have seen dermal rollers or needling. Um, yeah, yeah. A bit of pin, pinwheel um, that mm. you sort of roll along the along the skin. So again, they're all in some fashion. They're they're trying to. Uh, stimulate uh, new collagen formation and, and give a rejuvenation to the skin texture. So that, that's another aspect about that as well. Okay. Um, go on, sorry. And I think the another question would be around ethics of it. Well, you know, if you, if you come across complicated uh, patients uh, who might want to go a bit too far with the whole procedures, how would you deal with, with, with those kind of scenarios where you don't think the patient should be doing it or the patient may be forced to do the aesthetics um, procedures? I think it's very, it's very difficult. It's something you get better at recognizing with time and I appreciate, I mean, there's, there's several ways you could look at this. Um, there's one argument which um, I can say that I, I don't subscribe to, but it, you know, if I'm not gonna do it, then somebody else will do it. At least I know I'll do it safely. But again, you're on dangerous territory there. Um, I, you know, I did my best to counsel them not to have it done if I felt it wasn't the right thing for them or if it was dangerous or they've just gone too far. The real, there's several difficulties. One is the sort of psychological and one is the physical. The psychological issues, obviously, I'm sure we've all heard of body dysmorphia. So mm -hmm. with things like that, it's very good if, if there's some kind of local psychology service you could get people to get in touch with. I appreciate on the NHS, it's extremely difficult. These services are very oversubscribed and it's very hard to get buy-in from the, from the, from the patient. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously if you sort of say, look, I'm not saying no, but you've got X, Y, and Z to deal with, first of all. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to do it, but we need to get you on top of, get you in a better place first. Please don't go to somebody else. It's not about the money. It's not about losing a customer. Otherwise, I would just do the procedure. It's just mm -hmm. this is going on. This is more important. Obviously, people being forced to have uh, procedures or surgery. I mean, that's a whole other level of you know that's technically a, a mm -hmm. physical abuse. Um, are very difficult to 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 prove. And again, something you might get better at spotting the time, but it, it's not that common. But it is very difficult to to to, to spot. Um, the physical side, obviously, there's certain, you know, contraindications, well, contraindications which can be hard or soft. You know, when people are on immunosuppressive therapy, I generally wouldn't want to treat them until they've finished that period, you know, if they're on chemotherapy. And, yeah, they might want to boost. And life is pretty rough. But, you know, you give them something, you, you do a procedure and they have a complication and they're going to get an infection worse. They're not really going to thank you after that happens. So, again, it's it sort of taking a... Um, a medical, you know, thorough medical and pharmacological history. Um, and there's the people who've had multiple procedures elsewhere. They're not, you're not sure what fillers they've had in because I've only mentioned hyaluronic acid. There's loads of them out there. Um, and some are permanent, some are temporary. Some are, I mean, some people may advertise I'm using hyaluronic acid, but, you know, there's, you know, brand A up here and there's brand sort of, you know, F down here, and you know the end price might be the same. The end price might be cheaper, but they're using some really slightly dodgy stuff potentially. Yeah. You just don't know what what's been done, or has it been put in the right place? You know, were they competent and having a bad day and put it in the wrong place, or were they not properly trained and just just having a go, or did they not have that awareness, that reflection, that kind of you know getting mentored, having people to talk to about? I've got this patient. I'm not quite sure what to do. What would you advise? Um, yeah. And I think that was the that was going to be my next question. Is there like a net support network for plastic surgeons or people who do aesthetics, uh, work aesthetics practitioners? Do you guys have a support network that you can tap into and say, well, look, I've got this really complicated case. What do you suggest? Well, um, I think it, it depends. Some I think most of us do have a network. Um, obviously, having 
qualified over 20 years ago, you know, I've got lots of people who I trust and people I'm particularly good at, you know, some particular aspect of something. And if I'm not sure about a, a breast case, I might talk to them or a hand case, I'll talk to them or, or so on. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got a big network of people I can call on, but I've, I've been, you know, around for a very long time. So, um, so that, and that's built up with, with time. Uh, obviously, in the area of social media, I mean, people, that there are study groups on, on Facebook and, um, you know, people will post up, post pictures of that and um, say, I've got a patient with X, Y, and Z, what would you advise? And you've got to take some of that advice with a pinch of salt because it, it's free advice. You don't know how much the person really knows. Obviously, if you know somebody on the group is actually pretty solid and you think, yeah, I can trust her or his opinion, that that's great. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it, it's just picking picking your, your mentors and your support sort of carefully, but there's nothing wrong with you know, putting out to social media, but take it all with a pinch of salt and then go to somebody, go to a trusted source, uh, however that is. Obviously, you know, I feel like I have to mention the sort of uh, coronavirus here at the moment, nobody's, it, well, nobody should be doing aesthetic procedures. I understand there are a few rogue practitioners out there who are still sort of advertising apparently, which I was shocked to learn. Uh, so a lot of people have, um, you know, shut up shop temporarily and oh. if they've got medical qualifications with that sort of nursing pharmacy uh, doctor whatever you know they've gone back onto the front lines there's, there's still work for them because you still have transferable skills you've got a lot of knowledge um so people are building up waiting lists at the moment so now now is a good time to um start doing maybe theoretical learning as opposed to practical learning um, yeah i think well that's one of the benefits of this lo uh, lockdown i suppose you can actually use this time to learn uh, and hone new skills and learn new things and aesthetics is one of the areas that we we've seen a lot of demand from pharmacists uh, especially because of the pharmacy cuts and a lot of the newly qualified pharmacists who want to explore other areas apart from just working in community so i think in certain ways this lockdown is a blessing in disguise um and that's uh, i think that's something that I would advise pharmacists right now, if you're out there listening or watching this video or later on you're watching this, uh, use a lockdown as a time to reflect and time to learn and time to improve your skills. And if after this lockdown uh, for months, you've not learned anything new, yeah. you've just wasted the time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And thank you again for coming, uh, Dr. Camille. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, hopefully we'll see you again in the future. Um, and I will leave a link about your, for the fundraising for your, um, for, for your mass, uh, on the description. Um, and everyone please, uh, donate wherever you can. Um, it's a difficult time for the whole country. Um, and we need to work together. And if this is something that will help our, uh, doctors and nurses in the front line, um, then please do uh, help as much as you can. Okay, uh, thank you. you. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions, you know, just find me on, mm -hmm. on Facebook or Twitter or something. Okay. Yeah, and again, we'll we'll, we'll leave a uh, contact um, on the description again for if you guys want to get in touch. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Bye. And on to our next guest. Um, a lot of you guys are familiar on the network with. Uh, Central Consultants is one of the accountancy firms that um, that's, that's been working with the Pharmacy Cooperative um, for about a year now. Uh, the IR35 issue has affected a lot of pharmacists, uh, the independent um, local pharmacists mainly. Um, we've seen how it's impacted the hospital pharmacists who work for the NHS um, as locums. And it's coming to the, it was supposed to be coming this year, but now because of the COVID crisis, it's been moved over to next year. Um, there's been a lot of information. We have been working quite closely um, with HMRC to try and get as much information out there for farms as possible. Uh, but as I'm not, I'm not an accountant, so we have uh, Anas, uh, who is the, one of the accountants on uh, Central Consultants. Central Consultants. Um, he will go into a bit more detail about the IR35, how it will affect you as a locum, um, and how you can prepare for it. So, uh, Anas, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you, you hear me? Can. Yes, I can hear you. So, Anas, um, yeah, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, do tell us a bit more about the IR35 and how it will impact the uh, locum. Uh, pharmacists. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for having us, uh, Sophie, to add Central Consultants, uh, me and my colleague uh, Emran. So uh, basically uh, IR35 is a uh, tax legislation that has been 
uh, introduced to uh, make sure that everyone pays the uh, the correct amount of tax and the uh, um, correct uh, amount of national insurance and, uh, contribution, whether they operate through a, a personal service company or whether they operate uh, through self-employment or typically uh, by a, 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 a limited company. Um, so uh, IR35 uh, has been introduced since uh, 2000 and uh, recently in 2017 uh, they've introduced uh, uh, they've introduced it to, to the public fund uh, as something called uh, off payroll uh, uh, working rule uh, and this uh, basically means that uh, anyone who is operating uh, 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 through a, a, a private um, a, a private uh, a service company uh, with the NHS or with any 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 public uh, 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 sector, um, regardless whether it's it's a, so basically a, 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 farm, a pharmacist or or a, or a doctor or uh, any anyone else uh, operating uh, dealing with the with the public sector, um, and that would 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 come to an end in two thousand and seventeen, and uh, basically uh, the public sector needs to assess whether uh, this person or this individual who is actually operating uh, through the personal service company uh, uh, will fall under IR35 or will fall outside uh, the scope of IR35. And uh, recently, uh, in 2019, they've introduced it to the private. They've introduced it to the private sector, and it was. Uh, but yet. Um, the, the 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 individual himself who is operating through a private uh, private uh, uh, service company uh, was able to to determine whether he falls under IR35 or not until later on HMRC said in April 2020 we'll stop that and 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 uh, 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 basically the the end company which is the client uh, will decide whether this. Uh, um, uh, Person who's operating through the uh, private sector, uh, operating through the private service company, uh, will fall uh, under IR35 or not. But because of this, uh, obviously this coronavirus and this COVID-19 uh, crisis, now it's been it's been delayed and deferred until uh, April 2021. Um, as you know, so uh, basically, how will this affect uh, the pharmacies and uh, people who are operating? Or contracting through uh, limited companies, um, it will affect them uh, based on who do they contract with, who do they work for, and um, basically, if you are working with uh, with a small uh, a small for a small client, um, it will not affect you at all. Uh, you will be exempt, uh, and you do not uh, fall under IR thirty five. Um, what what do I mean by a small um, a small uh, 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 company or a small client is if they have less than 50 employees that's what's been uh, uh, defined by HMRC uh, as as a small or a micro uh, 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 company. So uh, if you contract for these these, these kind of uh, uh, companies, uh, if you work for a small pharmacy or if you, if you work for a, for a, let's say a pharmacy who actually employs less than 50 people. Or if it, if it has less than 50 employees working underneath it, uh, you you do not fall under IR35. So you should be safe. You should you can continue working uh, 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 through your private uh, uh, service company. And uh, the, the, the the difference is you will you will only be uh, 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 responsible for your own tax uh, through your company. So you will be uh, uh, paying your 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 taxes through your company. Or if you are a self-employed person. You'll be paying your tax with to your tax return at the, at the end of the uh, uh, tax year. Uh, if you uh, if you actually work for one of these uh, big uh, small medium enterprises, or if you work for a for a for a, a, a big a, a bigger company uh, uh, as a contractor, and um, if, if it's uh, if it's in a private sector, then uh, you still have the uh, uh, um, you still have the, the responsibility to, do, to assess yourself to decide. Whether you fall under IR35 or not, uh, and that you, you can do that through a, through a, a link that HMRC has provided uh, to let you know whether you fall under IR35. It, it basically gives, um, it, it asks you a few questions, and depending on your answer, 
uh, you, uh, uh, you you will see you will see re you receive a result or or or, an, or, 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 a, or a, a, um, a a result showing whether you fall under IR35 or uh, uh, outside of the scope of IR35. Um, there the, 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 there has been an argument whether uh, this test is is actually 100% accurate or if this test with HMRC can be challenged and it, 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 it can be inaccurate. Um, HMRC claims that this test is 100% is, is sure, 100% accurate, 100% uh, 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 positive, uh, and, 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 and there's, there's no doubt, that, doubt uh, about it. Uh, but there has been a few cases uh, that uh, some, some individuals, some, some companies have challenged HMRC and they have won. Uh, 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 the challenge uh, with HMRC, um, but as for pharmacists and uh, who, who are actually contracting for small companies, um, we we as an accountants uh, 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 would we would say that they, they they do not fall under IR thirty five, and they can they can they can continue uh, uh, working uh, uh, under their personal service company, um, and they will be responsible for their own taxes. You know, whether they were a, a limited company or whether they're self-employed, but they, they have, the thing is that every case has its a, 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 its own a, a determination, its own its own decision. So uh, we work on a case by case um, a, a decision. Um, what else is that there are a few a few elements that also decide uh, whether you fall under IR thirty five or. Uh, 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 you do not fall under IR35 if you were working for, a, for one of the big big companies who actually are uh, uh, considered as small or medium enterprises. It's whether you can be substituted or whether you can uh, 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 you, you decide your 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 working hours um, or whether um, um, you can do you can work for a, for, a, for a different cli uh, client when you are contracting with this with, with the same client. Um, so there are many questions uh, uh, that that can be found on on, on HMRC website um, uh, through, through this quest, small like a questionnaire that HMRC has introduced um, uh, to help uh, uh, these private uh, uh, or these uh, people who are operating through the uh, the private limited companies to assess whether they fall under IR thirty five or, or or not. Any, any, any thank you, Anas, um, and thank you for your uh, feed, um, for your talk today about the IR35. I think some of the questions that um, locums have put forward previously about the IR35 is uh, working for. The, you know the, the working pattern is very very different for for locums. It varies. Some people will work for the same company in different branches, um, but then some sometimes they'll work for few different companies um and then there are others that will work just for one company um and all the way through so if someone was to say work for uh one large multiple yeah but they're working uh, a number of different branches throughout the year would they still fall within ir35 yeah basically um well if, if they work for, for one of the large uh, 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 companies and um, uh, they need to make sure that their contract with these uh, 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 large companies uh, fall outside of the scope of IR35. So um, they need to assess themselves, they need to, to, to take the assessment that HMRC has introduced and, may, and answer all the, all the questions that HMRC has asked and, see, and decide whether they fall under IR35 or not. This is the, the, uh, until now. Uh, 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 the, 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 these individuals who are operating through their private uh, 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 service companies, they have the choice to decide and they have the, the, the choice to assess whether they fall under IR35 or not. But uh, like, like like we said at the beginning, uh, in, in 2021, uh, uh, these large intermediaries, these large uh, large clients, they will have they will have to decide whether these. These client, these contractors fall under IR thirty five or not? It, it wouldn't be given the, to, to, to these uh, individuals. It will be taken uh, taken off them, and and the, the large intermediaries will decide uh, 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 on them whether they fall so, under IR thirty five or not. So, say a um, 
Elokum decides that they don't fall and die at 35. Would they have to make any major changes to the locum contract? For I know one of the one of the key tests for uh, on the on the CES tool was uh, the right to substitution. Um, so if a company doesn't give you the right to substitution, so basically if they, which the right to substitution is basically when you can decide to send somebody else in your place, but the company pays you and you pay the third party. Yeah. So if that clause isn't there, would that be one of the reasons to fall within IR35? Um, not, not necessarily. So basically, um, even though if, you, if, 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 if the contract does not give you uh, uh, the right to substitute yourself, uh, you can still fall outside the IR35. So basically, uh, uh, the, the, clause, the clause needs to be is, said in the agreement uh, uh, whether the, 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 the contractor or the, or the client or the end, end client agrees to substitute, substitute you or not uh, even though if he doesn't if he doesn't agree to substitute you you can still fall outside the, uh, the scope of IR35 um, it, it just it, it depends on, on if this if this if this factor is, is, is there it, there needs to be more questions or more more clauses added to the agreement uh, that actually takes you outside the scope of, 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 of IR35 uh, and so, so, so some of these uh, some of these scopes uh, can be I've, I've got a few a few of them here um, so, so some of them is whether you pay for your or whether you get any contribution from your from your from, from the company that you work for from, from the client that you you, you are contracting with so if he, if he pays you any fuel or if he pays you any, any subscri annual subscription if he pays if you pay if you, if you pay them on your behalf, uh, then you might be you might fall under IR thirty five because you, you might be you might be considered as, as an employee and, and you, need, you need to put you on the payroll. Um, but uh, what, so, so some other things is uh, um, so like I said the, co the corporate benefit and also uh, if 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 the if the large if the client pays for your equipment, pays for your subscriptions, pays for your for, for your fuel, pays for all these these matters. I think most, with most locums, companies don't pay anything apart from the daily fee, and you can yeah. negotiate mileage and sometimes if it's um if they're traveling quite far um you can negotiate uh, the hotel fee, but that's quite rare at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I think in most cases it will just be the locum fee that they pay the hourly rate. Yeah. Um yeah. I don't know if we've already seen some companies uh, bring out a new contract for locums that give them right of substitution. We're just not sure exactly how that will be used um, in case of an emergency because it does put the burden on you, the locum, to uh, find another replacement in case you can't make it to work on the day. Yeah. Um, and as thank you. Uh, I think we've we've um, gone past our uh, scheduled um, length of the uh, of the event. Uh, thanks for you to, uh, for coming to the event today and uh, yeah. giving a thing to thirty five. And I think with the I thirty five is complex to say the least. And with our, with the HMRC losing a lot of the cases in tribunals so far, um, I think there'll be a lot more information that needs to be clarified before uh, next year, hopefully. And if it can be stopped ideally. Uh, that'd be even better. Um, yeah. But I think if it, what we'll do is if, if anyone does have any more questions, if you want to uh, get a bit more detail about the IR35 or whether it might apply to you uh, based on your scenario, um, give Centre Consultants a call. Uh, we'll leave the we've left the um, contact number and email address uh, on the descriptions, so you can get in touch with them um, through that. Um, and again, thank you, uh, thank you, Anas, for coming today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, so, guys, that was the uh, event for today. Um, we did have one more guest coming, Tony Cole. Uh, he hasn't been able to come, but we he sent us a message for for everyone. So, um, Tony, um, so Barclays would like to let everyone know that the um, if if you need any information about funding. Uh, or a business on there available um you can contact tony cole again i'll leave the contact details uh, on the description um 
the message they've sent us is that uh, we can we can consider uh, overdraft business loans and owner occupied commercial mortgage loans. Uh, we can offer up to ninety percent our loan to value for commercial mortgages with properties and up to eighty percent loan to value for occupation leasehold against um, a going concern valuation. Um, so that that was a message from Barclays um, um, partner on this event. Um, again, uh, hopefully we will have. Uh, a number of events coming up later in the year. Um, we want to try and do the uh, the practical aesthetic side um, in a number of different locations after m lockdown is over. Um, and we are also planning on running another event on um, startups. So those of you that are inclined to start up your own uh, health tech company or your own company full stop, um, we want to kind of go into the journey of how, to, how you go from uh, a concept to uh, the final product to the business side of things so hopefully that'll be coming later on the year as well once this whole lockdown is over um but again thank you thanks for coming today um and everyone who came online and we've got a lot of questions on there uh, on facebook at the on uh, youtube at the moment we'll try and get to everyone and trans uh, try and answer all the questions um yeah so thanks for coming <laughs>